Steve, welcome to Autosport International. Happy New Year to you. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, uh, this is a magnificent showcase, isn't it, for uh, the motorsport industry uh, and really sort of uh, conveys how good we are in Britain at this sport we all love. It does, and, it's, uh, and it also conveys to me that, um, uh, that motorsport isn't just Formula One. Formula One is the ultimate pinnacle of, uh, of, of competition and motorsport broadcasting, but it's not anything and everything. And I, and I think um, uh, if I get a chance to talk about what's happening on the broader scene of motorsport coverage during the next 10 minutes or so, uh, I think the hard work that we need to do is not in underpinning the quality of uh, our Formula One coverage, which has never, ever been better, uh, thanks to the BBC, but just looking long and hard about what we're doing for the rest of British motorsport. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, Formula One wouldn't be Formula One without the, the multi-layered disciplines below it, uh, both on and off the track. That's true. Uh, and I think uh, that the, those deserve some sort of recognition on terrestrial television. I, th I think the great structure that we had for television maybe back in the 80s when I got more seriously involved with the BBC and Murray and James and everything else through the 90s and so on, what the BBC were doing there uh, was, was, was regarding Formula One simply as one, the ultimate component, but one component of, of, of their whole motorsport portfolio. So that began with Formula Three, it began with the British Touring Car Championship, which we, we helped pioneer through, through Grandstand and so on. There was a huge commitment to the British Rally Championship, the World Rally Championship and so on. Uh, the second that the BBC lost Formula One to ITV, that commitment disappeared. Mark Wilkin, who is the outstanding producer of the BBC's current Formula One coverage, and myself tried to persuade the BBC over the next 18 months to make a stronger commitment to the Touring Car Championship, to F3, to single-seater racing sports cars, whatever could be found to replace uh, the gap led by, uh, left by Formula One. The BBC's attitude was, we're out of motorsport. Uh, we have no enthusiasm left. If we haven't got Formula One, we don't get, want to get involved in t uh, at all. Health and safety reasons, tobacco sponsorship, whatever, the environmental lobby. And within two years, uh, the BBC was out of all four-wheeled motorsport and, and have never come back uh, apart from their current commitment to Formula One. And I think that people talk a lot about the damage that's being done by the current Formula One deal, Sky, BBC, and so on. To me, there's greater damage being done by... Uh, the major British championships and the major British motorsport activities being absent from terrestrial television uh, than anything else. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. In, in fact, if we don't put Formula One on the front cover of autosport, um, it doesn't sell very well. Um, it was never like that. As a kid growing up reading it, it was a Group C car, it was a rally car, it was a Formula Ford, a Formula Two car, even a sporting trials car. It didn't matter, but uh, it, it's not the case anymore. It's all connected. Uh, and you were able to argue the sort of synergy between the small events or apparently small events that the BBC were doing a grandstand from Thruxton or from Snetterton. And there was a connection between that and what was ultimately being seen in Formula One. Through our Formula Three coverage uh, on grandstand, we got our first view of Senna. We got that great Senna Brundle battle. We got our first view of David Coulthard. Uh, Damon Hill, Mika Hakkinen, uh, Formula One world champions in the, in the making, all got a first introduction to the audience via the BBC's commitment to domestic motorsport. I would just love to see that commitment um, put in place again, uh, maybe as a kind of consolation for what the Formula One audience is losing in terms of terrestrial coverage. How do you think that's going to come about? What do we need to do? I don't know. I, I think an irrevocable step has been taken. Um, I'm going to be doing some work for Sky, but I'm not here as a sort of cheerleader uh, for Sky. I, I, I think their involvement in Formula One was inevitable. Uh, I think their long-term domination of Formula One is also inevitable, whether it's two, three, four, or five years away. Uh, I think it's going to happen, uh, which means that the BBC retreat entirely uh, from motorsport. Uh, but does that need to happen? I think the BBC, if they're going to bask in the glow of what's happening with their Formula One coverage, need to extend that uh, to sort of back up there, to recreate the influence that they used to have and the support they had for British motorsport. British Rally Championship, World Rally Championship desperately needs terrestrial coverage. Formula Three Championship is uh, the same. Uh, and the BBC will appreciate 
like it used to 20 years ago, that it's all joined up. It's all connected. It's all motorsport. Yeah. Is there an argument that says uh, perhaps the BBC wasn't looking in the mirrors uh, when Sky came uh, charging up behind? I think it was looking desperately in the mirrors because the money was running out and, uh, and it was looking for some kind of formula to stay involved. Uh, I think the mistake, and I, and I wouldn't um, make a criticism uh, or an accusation of what the BBC did lightly, but the impression I get when the BBC came in for Formula One when ITV stepped aside uh, in, what was it, 2008, uh, there was an opportunity for the, for, uh, for the BBC to renegotiate its entire involvement in Formula One, to do a deal, uh, to reduce the price, to increase the involvement, uh, to add certain parameters to what it was able to do uh, in the future, and, and in a way guarantee the future of Formula One on terrestrial television. Failed to do that, came in at the absolute top price, announced a deal within 24 hours, realized that the production budgets uh, compared to where they were in 95 when the BBC had left the sport, the production budgets had gone through the roof. And inevitably, in three years' time, the whole thing hit the buffers. Now, how the sport on terrestrial television handled that uh, was largely down to the BBC, and the BBC have decided to do a halfway deal with Sky, which opens the door to whatever Sky want to do with the sport uh, in years to come. There's been a, uh, an, an element of ill feeling about the Sky BBC shared deal, but I think it's worth reiterating, isn't it, that um, the BBC was potentially going to walk away entirely. And without, without sharing the deal, there would have been no deal. Yeah, uh, there, there were a few options up in the air. There was also an option to take the coverage to Channel 4, and I saw the presentation that Channel 4 put forward or had prepared uh, which was everything, uh, or pretty close to just about everything that Sky was guaranteeing and paying. Uh, and that would have also guaranteed the future of Formula One on terrestrial television. Why that didn't happen, whether the BBC had an influence on the sport going or not going to Channel 4, hasn't been properly answered yet, but there was an opportunity there for the sport to remain on terrestrial television, and it wasn't taken. Uh, and I think we now have this halfway deal in which Sky have been given the opportunity to completely dominate the sport. The BBC, in turn, have been given the opportunity to say, well, we've taken one step backwards, we'll take another and another and another, and eventually we will disappear from the sport entirely. And that's the situation we're in now. Yeah, it's a shame. Um, you've got a, a passion for all sports, uh, um, uh, both as a fan as a, and as a professional, but motorsport is one of your great loves, one of your original loves. You're going to be involved uh, in Sky. Uh, you're going to be uh, performing a series of unique interviews, aren't you? Not unique, it'll be the same old stuff with all the same old drivers, but it'll, <laughs> it'll be unique for me because it's a unique opportunity just to, to sit down with, um, for a start, all the surviving world champions that are in the world today and, and, and just going back over the great stories. To an extent, I suppose it's me going back over what I regard as the good old days, you know, the late 70s where I worked uh, quite closely with Lotus and Andretti and so on, uh, and the mid-80s and, and, and the introduction of Senna and so on. Uh, so it's a great opportunity to just go back, sit people down for half a day a day, and just explore uh, their careers and, 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 and the headlines that have come from those careers. We're with Mario Andretti uh, in America for two days in uh, a couple of weeks' time. We were in the south of France with Alain Prost last weekend. We had some time with Emerson Fittipaldi in Sao Paulo, a day with Jackie Stewart, which, trust me, is not enough, uh, which is, was absolutely riveting stuff. Uh, and the schedule will go on. We'll be out in Australia with Alan Jones and, uh, and so on. So it's a, it, it's a great opportunity just to make sure that all those stories are told and all those stories can be replayed and replayed. That, on that, that's wonderful. That's my, that's my dream job. So I uh, hate you for that. I've got it, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's going to be shown uh, during uh, a Grand Prix weekend, during the build-up? Do you know, I've got no idea. We're, we're, we're just uh, hoisting these things into the ether. It, it, it'll be shown in various elements and all this new technology that I can't really understand on phones, on tablets and all that sort of thing. But there's uh, a kind of open-ended commitment to Formula One uh, on race day weekends, and um, these things will find a home either at five-minute length or one-hour length right across the schedule. And um, 
uh, I'm looking forward to it. And it gets me away from all the, the sharp end and all the tension that's been uh, going to be involved around the live coverage. I'm, I'm too old for that. <laughs> um, how do you see the dynamic between David Croft and Martin Brundle uh, on Sky and indeed with uh, Ben Edwards and DC on the BBC? There's some new teams uh, coming forward this time. I, yeah, I, th I think it's all very exciting. I, I'm delighted for Ben because uh, there aren't, you know, coming into Formula One as a commentator is a bit like coming into Formula One as a driver. Uh, there are a lot of people out there with ability, but there are never enough seats available. So there, there was only ever one, maybe two seats available. And Ben was always the one uh, who got rather overlooked. I've worked with, with Ben for a number of years on the Touring Car Championship, and I know his his knowledge and his passion for Formula One as well. He will be absolutely outstanding uh, for the BBC, and, 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 and he and David Coulthard will, uh, will work well together. And, and David, I'm sure you've been hearing from, um, is also exploring exactly the different kind of dynamic that will be required to work alongside Ben compared to Martin. Martin and um, David Croft, I think, is going to be fascinating uh, because David Croft is an outstanding professional broadcaster, but he's got opinions and he's got a style, which I think is a perfect foil for Martin. And it releases Martin just a little bit more to, to explore the fringes of the production, which, uh, which I think last year he was uh, finding a little bit tough to dedicate himself to everything else that was involved. Yeah. We're back, aren't we, to more traditional setup of uh, broadcaster and ex-driver uh, on both platforms? Uh, yeah, I suppose we are. I th and, uh, and it is the natural thing. Um, and I think, uh, I think the interesting thing is going to be whether Sky are able to throw anything particularly different uh, into the pit lane presentation and the kind of personalities that are involved in the build-up to the race and, and, and the sort of red-button forum kind of area afterwards. I think that they might have a few ideas up their sleeve in, uh, in that kind. But, it's, but I think people... Uh, are mistaken if they think that, that you, you can actually change the style of Formula One presentation. I, I think we've reached a point, uh, and ITV brought us there uh, over the course of the nine or ten years that they were uh, presenting Formula One. Last race that I did, or last couple of races I did for the BBC back in the mid-90s, we were either in the studio in Shepherd's Bush or we had one camera on a, in a pit lane in, in Portugal or something like that. ITV moved that on. Uh, substantially. Every race uh, and the entire production came from trackside, from the pits, from the paddock, as close to the action as is physically possible. The BBC, with their extra air time and their extra resources, took that on even further. Now, you can't take that on to any further degree without actually getting in the car with the drivers. So, uh, so I think Sky's ambition is to try to get close. Uh, and I say get close because they won't equal in the short term, what the BBC have achieved in the last uh, three years, which has been outstanding. Absolutely. Um, quick word about the British Touring Car Championship. Uh, you've fronted that for ITV4 for uh, a number of years. Unprecedented levels of uh, Sunday afternoon coverage. I mean, six hours or so of coverage, yeah. culminating in that um, beautifully scheduled uh, live final race on a Sunday afternoon. Are you going to be involved in that again? Yeah, I will. And, and, and that's the great thing about the flexible deal that I've got with Sky. It, it, it makes you available to still do all the things that you really love and care about, which is live presentation uh, of British motorsport. And it brings me back to the theme that we started with, uh, that ITV, bless them, when they stepped aside from Formula One, they didn't react like the BBC. They said, right, we'll throw extra resources into the grassroots, into the, uh, into the British championships that, that need airtime, that need terrestrial support. Uh, and we've got 70 hours of live coverage once again coming up this year, which goes through the range of uh, the British Touring Car Championship, uh, but of course all the other formulas, Renault Clios, Ginettas, uh, and everything else. And, it, and I think it is, it is a vital commitment to British motorsport in, in television terms, which you, you would just love uh, that commitment to be taken on, even in a small degree by the BBC as well. It remains a magic formula, doesn't it? Guys uh, banging into each other in, in cars the, that we all recognise. Um, Are we talking no about Formula One? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, British Touring Car Championship uh, it remains uh, Britain's premier uh, series. So I guess it's good to still be involved. Oh, uh, yeah. It, it was, we, we started getting involved in um, uh, 85, 86 with the BBC when I sat down with Murray and, um, and Tiffany Dell. Uh, and we sat in the, in, in the editor of Grandstand's office 
the BBC's contracts with their various circuits, which were completely random, were all running out. Where can we go next? And we devised a system by which we could get involved in the Premier Saloon Car Championship, British Touring Car Championship, Premier Single Seater Championship in F3. Uh, and we had some great years uh, as a result of that. Uh, and I think that um, it was the perfect example of how you could take a championship from a fairly moribund state, one manufacturer, a couple of manufacturers, 2,000 people coming through the gate, to what we had maybe in the early 90s, where you had average attendances of 35,000, eight manufacturers, and something that really ignited the, uh, the imagination of the motorsport public. That was what terrestrial coverage could do. Uh, and I'm delighted that 25, 30 years on, uh, it, it is still as, as healthy as it was in those days. Who's the new Ben Edwards, then? I've got no idea. Oh. I've got no idea. I think um, probably Adrian Charles. Uh, I think is, is right. Okay, that's the end of the BTCC on television. Then, <laughs> <laughs> Steve, I'll let you go. Uh, great to talk to you. Uh, My en pleasure. Enjoy the season, ladies and gentlemen. Steve Ryder. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve.